My name is Gerald Henry Cogswell Millington. I was born on the 7th of February 1912 in Trowbridge. When recently I was introduced to the rector of St James's Church, he said, Millington, are you one of the famous Millingtons? I don't know, I replied. You know, the one who played the organ at the church for nearly 50 years, and when he became tired of the sermons, he retired to the George Hotel for a quick one, until one Sunday the parson gave a short address and there was no music for the last hymn. In that case, I am, I replied. In fact, he was my famous grandfather, who played before royalty, the Kaiser at Windsor, and received the royal warrant for teaching royalty the piano. His son, Ernest Charles, was my father, who kept the music saloon in 4th Street and had a small factory where Millington pianos were made until his death in 1925. After describing memories of Trowbridge in those days, the rector suggested that I put some on tape. So here goes. Well, my memory takes me back to the First War, the blackout, my mother pushing a pram in the dark with an oil lamp tied to it, the searchlights while staying on holiday in Portsmouth, the noise of the factory steam hooters on Armistice Day 1918. I also recall the fire at Chapman's Mattress Factory, a five-story building, the Australians' soldiers getting the girls to jump from the windows into the bis at Cradle Bridge and hauling them to safety. Another memory at that time was the tank, which was once in the park. It came trundling along by the sea road on its way from the station to the park via court fields, now the lower part of the park, and to show that it could do, collapsed the high wall as it entered the park. During my school days, we lived in Clarendon. I well remember the Tuesday markets, the floods at town and cradle bridges in winter, and the number of local characters. The rector mentioned a Mr. Paradise had been stopping him for a chat. An old man, I required. Did he have a squeaky voice? Yes, he did, replied the parson. Then it must be Sammy Paradise, the oil man. In those days, Sammy had a horse and cart from which he sold paraffin from a large barrel and also dealt in pigeons, rabbits, or perhaps a ferret or two. I should never forget that voice. Ho! 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 He would shout. One day he came by. I said, Sammy, I have two young pigeons. What will you give me for them? He came down the garden, looked at them and offered sixpence each. On one condition, I said, I don't want to see them on Mr. Wharton's, the fishmonger's slab. He promised to find a good home. However, the next day, returning from school, I saw the dead pigeons on Mr. Wharton's slab. Another character was Freddie Stevens. He resided at the lodging house, which was situated opposite Gasworks Lane, and so it was said, cost a pricely sum of two and six per week, 
whether for full board or not, I don't know. However, Fred's business was to go round the streets looking in the dustbins before they were collected. He was a big fellow with rosy cheeks and a beard. He wore a cap made up of several segments with a button on the top, old shoes and trousers covered with two dirty raincoats, one on top of the other, tied with a piece of cord around the waist. The tops of the coats stood out as though covering a woman's bosom. Here were his money bags, so it was said. He went around the streets with two sacks over his shoulder, one for bottles, jam jars, rabbit skins, etc., the other for bits of cabbage or other vegetables. When approached, and we did tease him, he went on like this. 1896, Jesus Christ, 1896, Jesus Christ, wicked waste, wicked waste, wicked waste, 1896. <laughs> Later, when I was working for ushers, I would see him waiting for Hilliers, the rag and bone merchants, to open. For here he sold his findings. Sometimes, he would have a half penny. What have you, Fred? I said as I approached. He held out his coin on the palm of his hand. 1896, Jesus Christ, wicked waste, wicked waste, wicked waste. 1896, I could see the coin from a distance, but no way would I get too near. The boarding house was near Usher's Dalamore stores where Banjo Sarah resided. He was a small, bald-headed man who dressed in an old frock-tail coat, pinstripe trousers, dicky and tie, together with burnt cork on his head for hair and a soft black hat. Some mornings he could be seen making his way to the gasworks with an old pram without tires to fetch coke. In the evenings, he had another role. He strolled from pub to pub, stopping in each doorway to play his banjo, an old instrument with torn vellum and one or two strings missing. To the accompaniment, he would sing Horsey Keep Your Tail Up or Show Me The Way To Go Home. He then entered the pub, took his hat around and if he had enough, would buy a pint. Another person was Fred, the firewood man. He lived in the cottage near Gasworks Lane, long since demolished. Fred wore two large circular knee pads, his legs strapped up behind his thighs. He walked on these pads with the aid of short crutches and got about the town for several years. He would stand like this at the bottom of Back Street and demand passers-by cigarettes or money. If one did not oblige, one had to look out, otherwise you were likely to get a clout from one of his crutches. Somehow he cut up old railway sleepers into bundles of wood and sold these from his donkey cart. However, suddenly he disappeared. The knee pads and crutches were found near the canal at Lady Down. The canal was dragged by the police, but nobody found. Months later, I heard the police had discovered him in Shepton Mallet, walking around perfectly upright and normal. Going back to my school days at the high school, I remember the teachers. Jimmy Henson, their head. If he caned a boy, he never came back to school. Reg Beams, Bemo. 
Sammy Powell, the Welshman. I recall him coming into the classroom one day, swinging an army officer's cane. Come out, Millington, and you trot. Hold out your hands. Bang, bang. What's that for, sir? I said. This is a new one. I thought I would let you know what it feels like. Jock Burns, who was, I believe, an Irish international 100-yard sp sprinter. Mr. Luckman, a man I always respected. We could do with a few masters like him today. I recall it was my first lesson in the upper fifth, a large classroom with a walk down one side to the master's room at the rear. During the lesson, another master passed down the room. I glanced from my book. Millington, come here, he said. He took my chin in his right hand, looked me straight in the face, and I shall never forget his words. Millington, when you are in my class, you will pay attention to me and no one else but me. And with that, he brought the back of his left hand down the side of my face, flipped it over and down the other, leaving a scar with his wedding ring. Another boy had similar treatment the next day. I can assure you there was not a murmur in that class for the rest of the year. Well, it was different to another who was on the soft side. We called him Dafty. He stood in front of the class and often raved. One day he called a boy out and said, Do you think I should be addressed as Dafty or Sir? The, the boy replied Dafty and was cane. One by one he had the whole class out and asked the same question. And with the exception of one poor lad, all answered Dafty and were given a stroke of the cane. In due course the break came, the class dismissed. The boys took the lad who had answered Sir over the playing field to a large slimy pond and then one boy taking his arms and one his legs threw him fully clothed into the water. Yes, there was an awful fuss. He was taken to the headmaster's house and put to bed. His parents collected him. Later, Mr. Henson stormed into the class. Harry Hilser, the form captain, was asked why we did it. He let the honour of the form down, sir, was the reply. And after that, not another word was said. Unfortunately, the boy never returned to school. I mentioned market days. These were held on Tuesdays and during the school holidays it was the usual thing to go to market. There was a market house with many stalls and out in the yard the auctioneers, I remember, Mr Foley Frank White and his son Jack, also my cousin Philip Snailham. On the right were poultry pens while sheep and pigs were kept on the left. Calves near the Castle Street entrance and at the bottom was a separate yard where huts, farm machinery etc were sold. At that time, there were no large cattle trucks, the cattle being driven to market, which brings me to two more characters. One was called Whistlepipe Sarah because he drove herds of cows to and from market, playing a whistlepipe as he walked behind. Another such gentleman was Pussy Kinton. That's what we called him. He also drove cattle and was often seen holding horses 
near the George Hotel while the owner the owners were carrying out his their business as boys we cycled to school and as we passed would call pussy pussy again we had to be careful as he would occasionally rush into the road and without a moment's hesitation thrust his stick into the front wheel and over the handlebars one went I can recall him well he was a tall and slim man wore an old bowler hat a spotted red handkerchief around his neck and a long grey raincoat also there was a Mrs Rodway she drove a donkey and car and sometimes came to the market I suppose a forerunner of the anti-field sports group she would go ra around the market snatching farmers walking sticks to stop them prodding or hitting the animals now how did we amuse ourselves in those days there was Trowbridge Town Football Club who played in the Western and Wilts Leagues on the flower show Griffield and later in By the Sea Road where the Wilts County Council offices are now also there was cricket at the county ground in the summer in the evenings there was the picture palace in 4th Street where programs were changed twice weekly and few films were missed for school children there seemed to be seasons we had wooden or iron hoops then whipping tops marbles all played in the streets as motor cars were few and far between then birds nesting in the spring most boys had a collection of birds eggs although we only collected one of each kind also in summer daily swimming either at Bradford bars or the bathing sheds on the river Biss which were for men only these were semicircular galvanized enclosures open on the river side with a long wooden seat where we changed into our swimming attire the river was clear at this point and rather deeper there was also a diving stage and a springboard so providing the water was not too cold we had plenty to do of course few of the businesses in the town remain the brewery knees uplands and the banks many of the public houses the market tavern new inn fitz the carpenter's arms the red lion king's arms kitchener's arms and the brewery tap have gone the lamp post in front of the town hall where people gathered on New Year's Eve and for announcements such as the election results has also been taken away on Saturdays the shop stayed open to late in the evening the town was crowded the Salvation Army band playing by the George Hotel and storeholders vending wares on the spare piece of land near Sainsbury's flour mills the stalls being illuminated in winter by large paraffin flares one storeholder I recall put a dozen gold hunter watches in packets and mixed with other packets containing trinkets and sold at sixpence each finally only the vendors cronies received the watches 
Another sold Lucky Beads at a shilling each. These were to be threaded on cotton and worn around the neck, next to the skin. As these changed colour, it was said one's luck would change for the better. I wonder how many coats of different colour paints were on them. As there were no refrigerators, people often waited late on Saturday evenings for the butchers to try and clear their stocks. Messrs. Vincent's, Church's, Garlic's, Bowyer's, doing good business in cheap Sunday joints. Without the radio or television, we made our own amusements having sing-songs around the family piano, playing cards or other games. In the summer, we walked around the countryside or listened to the bands which played in the park on Sunday evenings. Wireless came in the early 20s. The first person to have it in Trowbridge was Mr. Henson at the high school and, shortly afterwards, Millingtons were appointed agents for Marconi phone and Gecophone sets at the music saloon. One spent many hours listening with headphones for the faintest sound of music or speech. There were concerts at the town hall. I remember such great pianists as Mark Hamburg. The Operatic Society performed a Gilbert and Sullivan annually. The Cycling Club and the Trowbridge Motorcycle Club held runs to interesting places. The latter club amalgamated with the Devizes and Melksham Clubs in 1931 to form the West Wilts Club, which has been so successful at Farley. I am pleased to be, I believe, the only founder still alive. Dancing was popular, as well as small dances held at St. James's Hall, the Labour Club and local village halls. The main attractions were the Hunt Ball, Conservative Ball and Dairy Ball, all held at the Town Hall. In the main hall, Nice supplied a special spring floor for these events. This was fitted on top of the block floor and, could, and one could dance on it for hours without tiring. For the hunt ball, a canopy was erected outside the entrance to the pavement's edge and many people watched the arrival of local society mostly arriving in cars. The ball lasted two nights, the first for the hunt members and friends and the second for the farmers. The hall and stairways were beautifully decorated with flowers and two dance bands took turns to play. After the first night, which finished in the very early hours, the hunt met outside the George Hotel for a day's hunting and after evening dinner many proceeded for a second night's dancing. The Dairy Ball for the employees and friends of the Wilts United Dairies as it was then was also a grand affair. The hall being draped in lemon and white cloth resembling a large marquee Refreshments were by forts of Bath and were excellent. Dancing would continue to 3 a.m. and then it was hands up for extending to 5 o'clock, finishing with a bowl of hot soup before wending one's way home. By the time one saw the girlfriend home, there was just time to change clothes 
and get to work. Other notable events were the Flower Show, Conservative and Liberal Fates, and later the four-day Hospital Carnival. The Fates held at the Flower Show, show ground had many attractions. The fun fairs and in the ring, horse jumping and often the musical gun carriage drive by the Royal Horse Artillery stationed at Froome Road Barracks to finish the day. A fine display of fireworks by Messrs. Brox or Paynes. By 1932, the slump was on us. My apprenticeship at Usher's Electrical Department, four years at 10 shillings, 14 shillings, one pound, and one pound 12 shillings for 50 hour week had ended. However, Mr. Usher saw me smoking a cigarette in working hours, so I was given 14 days notice to leave. Luckily, I was offered a position with a communications company in Bristol for one month. This lasted 44 years from Wireman the divisional manager. To keep this employment, I rode my motorcycle to Bristol, arriving by 8 a.m. and returning after 6 p.m., also half day on Saturday. I did this for nine winter months and then decided to leave Trowbridge. However, I still like to visit frequently and I'm very proud to see Millington Drive.